How are you doing ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ingus from IGS Electronics and today we're going to be having a, a bit of an educational uh, video uh, where we're going to be talking about a encoders, how encoders work and more specifically is how do we choose the correct encoder for a correct application. So the reason I'm doing this video is because I'm currently working on a project for upgrading one part of the machine and I need to replace an old uh, positioning uh, system that used to have uh, individual uh, like separate standalone controllers that were able to activate contactors on and off from left and right and position the, the, the screw where the, the position of the specific equipment needed to be in, in, in uh, absolute locations. So I need to replace that because those con those those controllers are no longer first of all are no longer available. Second of all, they used to be manufactured somewhere in Thailand where it was used for Thailandese markets. So uh, yeah, it's 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 come time to now to replace it. So uh, for me to be able to do that, I'm first I need to understand what encoder I have and what sort of equipment I will need to use. So I come to a, a subject today is to talk how I choose uh, the equipment uh, for specific encoders because it is very important for you to understand three aspects of the actual encoder. What is A and B, what is resolution and what is frequency and knowing those three uh, points for incremental encoder from that point we can actually work out what sort of cards, input cards that we need to use and not necessarily overspend a ton of money on a cards that we don't really need. So in this video, let's have a look at it, how actually encoders works and how to identify uh, the equipment that we need for a specific encoder for specific application. So let's get started. <music> So to get ourselves started more into understanding how encoders work, we're going to go back all the way to very, very beginning and talk about from very, very simplistic way how to understand how encoders work. There's not going to be no science stuff into it. There's not going to be any fancy wording into it. We're just literally going to talk like person for the first time hearing anything. So the one thing that we all know is, is, is uh, or the proximity sensors. So this is our proximity sensor, okay? You can actually use proximity sensor as your encoder because every time come, something comes on top, it goes on, leaves, it goes off. And you can do that really, really fast with, the, let's say, with the, a, a motor spinning and it will count every time. As long as the, the sensor is able to process that pulse, everything goes past. We're going to get to that in a minute, the processing times in a minute. So you can literally use a basic sensor as your uh, as your counting, basically as what we want to call it as an encoder. So now that, but what happens if we need much more higher resolution? We're gonna get to that in a minute. We want to a sort of a uh, combine it everything so we can get much more pulses per revolution. So what we do, we put the disc on top of it, like in this guy in here. That's why they often round. And let's say from the simple terms, that disc has got 100 holes all going around it. As it spins, uh, uh, the, the sensor, let's say the laser pointing it through, there's a little bit, uh, instead of a proximity sensor, let's say there is a laser beam going in there, and every time the laser is broken and goes back on, that will be count as a pulse. So this way it spins around and it picks up those pulses as it goes around. And let's say a full revolution, let's say 360 degree, will give us 100 pulses. Very simple, in the simple words, that's exactly how encoder works. That's all it does. It just picks up the pulses from internal sensor that is built inside encoder itself. So now that we know that how encoder works, so let's talk about A and B and Z. What are those three things? In most common, most common ways, you will see A, B and Z. So in a simple terms, let's start with A and B. Imagine there is two disks inside it in this little thingy that they are spinning and both of them are sending back signals increments so you can actually use a and b separately you can use a phase to read increments and you can use b phase to read increments so this way 
it will what all it's gonna do as it spins, no matter which way it spins, it will just keep breaking that sensor, and it's gonna say, Oh, there's my pulse, 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 pulse. So system basically just gonna keep counting up, 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 up. So then one day they, they, they whoever was clever enough to come up with a good idea says we need to come up with a very smart idea of how to tell the system that it should count down. So what they have created is those two A and Bs in here. So what happens is when they both spin. So now the system, the controller itself, must be able to process A and B signals and understand the logic what it needs to do. And the logic there is if A, if you spin clockwise, A will come on first. And that way, because A has now come in first and the system has to be able to process that information, because A come out first, it will say, yeah, that's my direction, I am going clockwise. And then comes B on. When A and B is on, that's the time when it, that the system is going to count that as one pulse. Up. Clockwise, it will, let's, say, let's say it will count it up. So, and, and then again, A will go off, then B will go off. So when you spin anti-clockwise, the B will come on first. And now system knows, A, the B has come on. I need to count down. And again, B, A comes on. So at that time, both pulses are on. So E will take that as a count and sequence continues. Now that's, ladies and gentlemen, what A and B is for. And the last thing is the Z. The Z is a full revolution. So every time there's a full revolution, full one RPM, let's say, Full revolution 360. Every time that happens, it's, 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 it'll count as uh, well, count one. So, what they often they call the Z mark, and that's used quite often for a uh, homing some of the a uh, servo drives if they need to be homed exactly to specific Z mark. Often that Z is used for that purposes. And that's ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen is A, B, and Z. Next up is a resolution. Resolution pretty much represents pulses per revolution. In my case, my encoder is 100 pulses per revolution. And the reason they often call it a, a resolution is because how fine you think it to be read. To give you an example, if you have 50 pulses for a full revolution, and if one pulse, uh, one pulse movement would represent one millimeter, so your resolution would be one millimeter one to one. So that's not very good. So let's say if you want to read 0.01 millimeters, you would need a lot more pulses per revolution to be able to achieve that kind of reading. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is why, what is resolution. And last on our list that we need to discuss, ladies and gentlemen, is a frequency. Frequency is actually quite important that we need to understand because that will very much determine can our uh, encoder and equipment able to do what we're trying to do. So uh, frequency is pulses per second. How many pulses has been generated per second? So every encoder manufacturer will indicate on their data sheets the maximum frequency the encoder is able to process it. So in same, we'll go for the actual uh, input cards, input uh, units like PLCs or input cards itself, will have on their data sheet to say what maximum frequency of pulses that the card is able to process. In my case, when I was uh, selecting my equipment, I was looking around the cheapest way possible, and I was checking out the MOXA cards, the MOXA cards, MOXA input cards. So uh, am I able to use it or not? So the first thing I need to do is calculate what frequency is going to be when I'm going to be spinning my equipment. And my equipment is running at the moment at a 60 RPM uh, per minute. So, uh, and the formula for frequency is RPM times the um, pulses per revolution divided by 60. So in my case, it worked out 50 Hertz. So I was well within the card I was going to use that was coming out uh, as far as I remember the data sheet, it was 250 Hertz. So I am now able to select much, much cheaper equipment to process the signals that I want to work with. And that ladies and gentlemen, is why uh, frequency is very important before you start selecting your equipment. Remember, the faster it spins, the higher the frequency, the, mm, then it's going to become a big problem for standard input cards. For me, again, you assess your equipment, you know what you're spinning at and what, uh, pulse, uh, what uh, how many pulses can be generated per second, and I'm able to go in a lower card. And that, ladies and gentlemen, what is frequency? And that will be it, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully I have covered as much as I can in this video to give you a better understanding of how encoders works and how to help you to understand 
what need what is needed for your equipment and what you need to do to choose the correct equipment for correct application if you do like the video do smash that like and do subscribe if you're new to our channel thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next video